ran into the first part of the chapter last week, uh, but kind of took a detour and studied out the, the thought or the topic of tongues. So we'll go back tonight to Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter 11. So we kind of been, have been studying through Genesis. We uh, looked in chapter 9 and we saw the flood. We saw the different things that happened there. Coming through chapter 10, how uh, the children kind of began to disperse. And then we come into chapter 11 where they are moving out into the earth. And so let's begin reading chapter 11, verse number 1. The Bible says, And the whore was of one language and of one speech. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. This they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down there, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So before we pray, and if I kind of get into this and forget to pray, somebody just stick your hand up and remind me to stop and pray. But I just kind of want to lay us a little bit of foundation. Notice back in verse number 25 of chapter 10, we pointed out last week that this was in the generation of Peleg, uh, that the land was divided. He says, Under Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Jotan. So we have a little bit of genealogy, we kind of have some chronology where we can trace back to where this is. But I think we can get a little more specific in the thought of what we want to look at tonight. That it doesn't take man long in his natural bent towards sin to begin moving back into sin. Although God's just wiped off the every man, woman, boy, and girl, every living thing off of the face of the earth. He's restarted now with Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. And it's less than about 101 years, if, I, if my math is correct, that now we're seeing this Tower of Babel begin to take place. And so we have not only a time marker here, that it's in the, in the time of Pele. But go back to chapter 9 with me, look in the last two verses. Verse number 28 and 29. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 28, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So we can go from that, that Noah had lived about 600 years. He's building the ark. He's, he's doing what God's called him to do in the latter part of that 600 years. Now the flood comes, and he spends the time on the ark, and then they're, they're coming off the ark. And he tells us he lived about 350 years after that. So Noah's an older guy. He's seen a lot. We looked at, at the different things that have happened in his life since the flood. And now go back to chapter 11 and begin looking at verse number 10 with me. I just kind of want to give us this little bit of foundation tonight. Noah's going to live about 350 years. But notice with me in verse number 10 of, of chapter 11. It says, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and began our faxed two years after the flood. So if we put a number two there. We begin reading, he says, And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years and begat sons and daughters. Okay, Arphaxad lived 5 and 30 years and begat Selah. So I want to know that Shem lived about two years after the ark and he had this son Arphaxad. Now Arphaxad has a son about 35 years later. So 35 plus 2 is giving me about 37 years. Okay, so every other verse is going to give us this, this time mark that we want to see. So our facts had lived, verse 13, after he begat Selah, 403 years, and begat sons and daughters. Selah lived 30 years and begat Eber. So my 43 plus 30 gives me about 67. All right. Verse number 14, Selah lived 30 years, begat Eber. Verse 15, Selah lived after he begat Eber, 403 years, and begat sons and daughters. Eber lived 4 and 30 years and begat Okay, so now that's going to take me back to chapter 10, verse 25. I know this is now in that generation. 
and he says he lived about 30 years. So my 67, or I'm sorry, my 67 plus 34 is what he's saying, 34, takes me to 101 years. Okay, so if I'm 101 years about, give or take, after the flood, Noah lives 350 years, guess what? who's still around to tell them stories about what it was like before the flood, about what happened during the flood, about how God delivered them after the flood, and what God's rules were, what God had told them after the flood. Chapter 10, verse 1, I believe, no, 9, verse 1, he says, go forth, multiply, replenish the face of the earth. Chapter 9, verse 7, he says the same thing. Go forth, replenish the earth. And so they're to move out into the earth and to replenish it. So less than 101 years, about 101 years, give or take, we see where they're at right now. So my message tonight is uh, that Babel is a picture of God's grace. Okay? But we're, now point number one tonight is that sin is our nature. Sin is our nature. But let's pray and ask God to help us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the word of God tonight that we can look at, Lord, that will give us warnings. Lord, my heart breaks for churches and for Christians that are in churches that hear nothing but the positives. Lord, nothing but the good news. Yes, there's much good news in the word of God, but it comes with a warning that our nature is, is sinful, that our bent is towards sin. And Lord, that we need to deal with that. And we need to look to you for guidance in our lives. But Lord, even when we find ourselves in a mess, we see your grace and mercy on our behalf. And Lord, I believe that's what we'll see in the message tonight. I pray that your Holy Spirit will have free course in our hearts and minds, that you'll speak through me and through the Word of God, Lord. Help us tonight. We need you. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let's begin reading verse 1 through 4 again of chapter 11. He says, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Wouldn't that be nice for missionaries today? We said last week with languages, if I had the ability to speak in tongues, it's not going to happen here in a church where everybody speaks English. You already understand everything I have to tell you, and I can explain the gospel to you in your language, in my language. If tongues were going to happen today, as it did in the Bible, it was to spread the gospel to those that couldn't understand my language. So God gave me the ability to speak so that you can hear it in your own language, in your own tongue. And so we looked at that last week, the different things about tongues in the Bible that we see. It was a known language. It was a spoken language. It was uh, guided by the Word of God. Jews were present. It was a sign, apostolic sign, that the church foundation was being led. It's not a one-up in a spiritual level that I've all, all of a sudden attained some spiritual gift. That is not scriptural. Uh, for me to begin speaking in a church service out, out of, um, could we just say chaos? Is not the word of God. That's not how God works. And so as we see this, what a blessing it would be, though, to be able to just go anywhere. And we live in Orlando where we've got a, a very multicultural population. We can't just speak to everybody because they speak different languages. So it would be nice to have this in a way. But notice what happens with it. Came to pass, verse number two, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to... Let us make brick and burn them truly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So number one tonight, sin is our nature. And no matter what I have been through, no matter what consequences are in the past in my life, I quickly, it seems, forget what God has had to do to bring me back into line with Him. I soon forget what I've, I've made commitments to. I've been on my knees, I've prayed, I've asked for forgiveness, and God has, has restored me. And it's not very long that I kind of get onto some cruise control, and I begin to forget those things. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble again, and I'm looking back for God to help me. And so this the Christian nature, or Christian life, dealing with this sinful nature. It's who I am in and of myself, and I need God's help. Go to Proverbs 26, 11, keep a bookmark here. But look at Proverbs 26, 11. I believe we can see a truth in this, that it is my nature. Proverbs 26 and verse number 11. I've been saved. It, it was uh, Brother Rostowski prayed it tonight. We've been saved from sin. We've been saved from that, um, from our sin nature. But yet I have, or, let me think, let me say it right. I've been saved from the power of sin. And yet I have the sin nature. So my sin nature is going to be bent towards sin. My desire might be that way. But I have the opportunity in Christ and through the Holy Spirit that lives inside me to say no to those things. 
Before I was saved, it's just me and I do what I do because I'm not a saved person. I'm a sinner and I just do what a sinner does. Now I'm a sinner saved by grace and I have the Holy Spirit living inside me. I have the word of God that I can hide in my heart and I no longer have to give in to that sin. And yet I have the sin nature that is constantly doing battle with the Spirit, isn't it? Hey, look at Proverbs 26 and verse 11. The Bible says there, as a dog returneth to its vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. That's telling me right there that in my nature, I, although I know it's wrong, although I've been on my knees, although I've had to repent, although I've had to confess of my sins, the fool, the man with that will follow that sinful nature will find himself back in a mess as a dog that will turn back to his vomit. Listen, I've got a dog that I absolutely love. She's probably one of the best dogs we've had, the best uh, behaved dog. We feed her twice a day, plus all the treats she can enjoy, and some table scraps as well. She's well taken care of. She's well groomed. But then I see her turn around, and she'll start licking up a puddle of her own mess. And I'm like, dog, what are you doing? Because later she'll want to kiss me on the face, right? I love my dog. But some of the things she does happens because she's a dog. Even if I domesticate her, she's still a dog. Even though I'm saved, I'm still a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Yet my nature wants to take me back to that nasty puddle. And God's saying, Christian, what are you doing? I'm giving you everything you need. You can feed all day long from the word of God. I'll give you all the treats. I'll, I'll treat you better than anything. Why would you go back over there? It's my human nature. It's my sin nature. And so I'm constantly going to be battling that. And so we see as this nation begins to move out, God has told them disperse to multiply, to replenish the earth. Not only was it a command, it's a blessing to do so. And yet here we come to this plain of Shinar. We barely get out of where we're going from. Hey, let's just settle down here and forget about God and his commands. Hey, old man Noah is saying, listen, y'all need to obey God. I've seen what happens when man don't obey God. Whatever. Whatever. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. 2 Peter 2 and verse 22. I believe there's a lot of old time Christians, there's a lot of old time pastors being ignored today as they preach the truth of God's word. They're giving out a warning, a strong warning, and yet Christians are bent on doing their own thing. They're bent on chasing their own nature rather than listening to the word of God tonight. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. The Bible says, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. Oh, we just came from Proverbs, didn't we? 26 and verse 11. What's that true proverb? The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now, growing up, we had pig farms around us. We had some cattle farms. Uh, but I remember going to the pig farm, and it stunk like crazy. But every once in a while, they would take a pig to the show. We're going to have, we got a show pig. So they would wash it up and put a little bow on it and do all the crazy stuff. You can go to the fair and see this, right? You look at this pretty pig. But as soon as they're done walking it around and showing it, what's a pig do? It can be as beautiful. It can be clean. It can have baby shampoo on it. It's going to go back and just in the mud puddle. Right? Squealing and squeaking. And just let me get money. Why? Because that's that pig's nature. So you and I, man, God will have to get on us. He'll try to fix us up. He'll clean us up. We're happy. Life is good. Uh, but if I'm not careful, I find myself wallowing back in the filth of sin. And so sin is our nature. Notice what he says here. Uh, in this passage of 2 Peter chapter 2, he's talking about false teachers. They've forsaken the right way. They have words that speak with... Um, uh, an appeal to my flesh. And so they begin to tell us. And verse number 19 says, While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought into bondage. For if after they had escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, then after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. God's saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Understand you've got a sin nature. Your sin nature's got a bent towards sin. And you're going to have to fight it. You're going to have to stay away from it. You're going to have to do what it takes 
to get away. So not only does a dog return to his vomit, a pig will return to the mud. A sinner has a sin nature that always pulls him towards sin. So we must be constantly aware of this, and we must feed the spirit and starve the flesh. How do we feed the spirit? Well, you'll get tired of hearing me say it. Read your Bible every day. Don't wait till midnight to do it. Do it first thing in the morning. Not to get it out of the way, but so that the Spirit has an opportunity to feed my mind and to protect me through the day. First thing I do, I get up and read my Bible, but then the next thing I do is make my coffee. Why? Because that's important to me. What is more important? Reading my Bible. What should be most important to the Christian? Get some Word of God in my mind. How about number two? Pray. Pray. Every day. Spend quality time in prayer. Not just, Lord, help me today. Please keep me safe on the road. Spend some time in quality prayer, communing with your God. And then fellowship with the believers. The fellowship and exhortation, he says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Why does he say that? Because we have nothing better to do on a Wednesday night, nothing better to do on a Sunday morning, Sunday night. We need it. We need the exhortation. We need the time together. We need the time in the Word of God, and God knows that. He set it up that way. And so if we're going to feed the Spirit, we need to be in our Bibles, we need to be in prayer, and we need the fellowship of our fellow believers. Notice in verse number 2, um, back in, in Genesis chapter 11 now, in verse number 2, we see that it's where they dwell. Okay? So sin is our nature, but notice that if I'm not moving forward spiritually, I'm moving backwards. You ever, uh, the illustration I've heard other people use, it, I've used it in the past, if I'm, bat if I'm paddling a canoe upstream, as long as I'm paddling, I'm moving forward, am I not? But what happens when I just stop the oars? Do I just stay where I'm at? No. I start to go backwards, don't I? We go to the springs sometimes, and we'll take tubes, and you're fighting and fighting, but as soon as you stop, you're, you've lost ground quickly, very fast. And the same thing's true in the Christian life. When I, if I'm not moving forward, I'm not sitting still. I'm going backwards. And so the quickest way for a sinner to fall back into sin is to quit moving forward spiritually. And we notice in verse number two, it says, as, they came, as it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. They were told to go out into the world, to replenish, to multiply, and yet they're dwelling. They've stopped. They've quit moving forward. And so when the Christian quits moving forward, we're also going to be in trouble. So it's a lack of spiritual power and desire that they have. Notice number two, that sin usually costs us what we don't want to lose. So not only is sin my nature, sin is then going to cost me what I don't want to lose. Look at verse four. What they say is, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. And so they don't want to be scattered. That's the one thing they don't want to have. And their language is then confounded. They are scattered. They'll blame God later. Oh, God's so mean. He scattered us. We could have had so much done. We could have, we could have done so many things. They'll blame God. But it was their choice. It was, it was their decision to stop and not obey God that he did this. And Christians and people today will blame God for all kinds of stuff. But it's man's choices. It's man's decisions that cost us. Let me give you some examples from our recent sermon. Uh, the drunk wants his job and family. His sin will cost him his job and family. The addict looks for peace, but it's his addiction that cost him his peace. The rebel looks for freedom. I don't like my parents. I'm not listening to them. When I'm 18, I'm moving out. I'm going to do my own thing. But my sin and rebellion cost me my freedom. The very thing I want, my sin will take it from me faster than anything. They want to stay there. They won't, don't want to have to move. They don't want to be scattered. And it's their sin against God that's going to cost them the opportunity and they're going to be scattered. So sin always costs us what we want to keep. Number three, sin usually has to do with pride in our lives. Look again at verse number four. And they say, let us make a name lest we be scattered. That's the name. Let's make us a name. The pride. I want to do this. I've got a better idea. God says move and I say let's stay. God says scatter. And, and go forth and multiply. I say, let's stay here and, and we'll, we'll just build this big tower. Let's make us a name. And so we think that we can get away with what costs countless other Christians, their ministry, their testimony, and everything else. But I know better. I can do this. I've got it figured out. Guess what, Christian? It's going to cost you just like it cost every other Christian that tried it. We think we can get away with the things that the Bible warns us against. 
What's that tell me? That I think I'm smarter than the God that gave me the Bible that tells me not to do some things? That tells me to stay away from some things? That tells me that the friends I hang around with are going to have an influence on me spiritually? But I all of a sudden think that I know more and I can do what I want. And we, like Satan in Isaiah 14, get the I wills. Satan says, I will, I will, five I wills. And they say, here, let us. And sometimes we get the let us, don't we? Let us do this. Let us take on this program. Let us take on something else. And it becomes what we're doing, what we're building, rather than what God would have us to do. And so God says, though all men rise up, though all rebel against me, what is that? Who are they? It's not going to happen. And so God begins to scatter them. Look at number, at number four tonight. God's dealing with sin is actually an act of grace. In verse number six, God then begins to scatter them. We can read verse five and six. It says, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. God didn't have to come down to earth to inspect it. God didn't have to come down to look at it. He could see it from where he was. God knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. He knows everything about us. He could see what they're doing. He already knew what their plan was. And yet God's a merciful, right? 2 Peter 3, 9 says that he is long-suffering, that he's patient, that he's not willing that any should perish. And so I believe God's giving them opportunity to turn to him He's given them opportunity to figure out that they're on the wrong path and they need to get it right. But then God comes down and he begins to look at it. Verse number six, behold, the people is one. They have one language. This they begin to do. They're again chasing this rebellion. They're chasing their own desires. They've left behind my command, my uh, opportunities I gave them, and they're going to do what they want. And so he, he says, look, let's confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Let's restrain them from the thing that they've imagined to do. Well, think back right before the flood. What did Noah say? What was said about the people? Every thought, every imagination of their heart was nothing but wickedness, nothing but evil. And where are they headed now? And God's mercy and grace is not going to allow that to happen. And so when God steps in, sometimes we say, well, God's mean. Why would God let that happen? Why is God going to act like that? It's God's grace. Remember what you said about the about the uh, the Garden of Eden? It was God's grace that chased them out of it. Had they taken a bite of the tree of life, they would have lived forever in their sin. But by putting them out of the garden and putting the, the angels with the flaming swords there, he prevented them from coming back in. And now they had opportunity to be redeemed and have eternal life. They no longer would have to live for eternity in their sinful state. So God's mercy is, hey... If I let them continue, they're going to continue in their own evil way, in the imaginations, the thoughts of their heart. Let me go down there and confound their language and fix this thing. So he prevents us from getting in too far. Sin is like sinking sand. I was talking to Brother Ed one time. We were talking about fishing, right? Sometimes you get into the muck, and as your boot goes in, you try to pull it out, and you can almost hear the... As the air is trying to exchange, and there's just not going to happen. And you get stuck. And then you're in the waves of the water, but your feet can't move. And you're about to flip over. And sometimes we know it. We take a step in there and we say, uh-oh. But instead of backing up, <laughs> I just go one more step. And next thing I know, I'm sinking. I'm in trouble. And sin's the same way. And sometimes instead of getting ourselves back out, we just plow forward. You know, you know what? And next thing we know, I'm like, ah, I need to fall. Sin's like sinking sand. And sometimes, although God gives us free will, he gives us free choice, the opportunity to make the decisions as a just God, as a holy God, he'll only let us go so far. I, I believe that you can, some people will say I'm wrong, but the, there's a sin unto death. Why? Because God's only going to allow you to travel so far into sin before he just takes you out. He can only, as a just father, he has to step in. He can only allow his child to go so far before he prevents further pain, suffering, and shame. Let me tell you with my own kids. I've, I've used the example before. Let's, let's use the example my kids don't lie to me, but let's say they're lying to me. Well, number one, as a police officer, I kind of have an idea when somebody's lying to me. So I look at them and I say, he's lying to me. But let me, 
let me let him give me his story. Then I've got a baseline, and then I'm going to start asking some questions and see how he tries to back paddle his way out of this one. Right? I do it on the street all the time. I get stories, and then I'm like, oh, you know, if that's true, then what happened here? What the, 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 oh, sir, I, oh, oh. Yeah, you're lying. What was I going? Oh. But I'm only going to let my kids do it so far. Right? I'm only going to let them get so close to the road out here, and then I'm like, stop! Get back here, and don't throw the ball near the road again. Why? Because I want to see, are they going to keep going, or are they going to push the limits, but I'm not going to let them get hit by a truck coming by. Get back here. And so sometimes God lets us push the limits, but then God says, cut it out. It's time. You're a child of mine, and I'm not going to let you get hurt any worse. And we see the consequences. Sometimes the consequences are just punching us in the face. And we're just like, <laughs> and we just keep going. And God has to rescue us from that. My sin nature takes me back to sin. I've got to bend toward it. It's going to cost me what I don't want to lose. When God steps in, it's his mercy and grace on my behalf. And I need to be thankful for that. Thank you, God, that you love me enough to stop me, to prevent me. And then there's other times when we continue just to quench the Spirit. And He's tapping us. He's yanking on us. He's trying to do everything He can. And we just keep full board, full dead. And guess what's coming? The dead end is coming quickly. And when it comes, we're going to cry, we're going to scream, we're going to fuss. But we made the choice. We made the decision to keep going when God was trying to stop us. Number five tonight, God dealing with sin is for the purpose of reconciliation. When I spank my kids, when I put them in their room, when I take their video games and their favorite things away from them, it's not because I don't like them. It's not because I want them to be mad at me the rest of my life. Oh my dad's so mean, I'll never like him again. It's not what I want. I want them to reconcile with me. I'm sorry, Dad. I was wrong. I won't do that again. Okay? When you hit it back, we, give, we restore things, don't we? We want to reconcile. My idea is not just to be mean and grumpy and angry all the time. And so God doesn't do it either. Notice in verse number 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. God wasn't being mean. I believe that as God sent this group of people this way into Asia, and this group of people into another area, and the Germans over there, and the English people speaking over here, it was a brand new opportunity to start again. To start brand new with God in a new direction and a new opportunity to reconcile and be right with God. That's a blessing. It's a blessing when God gives us a second chance and a third and a fourth and a fifth and however many I need. And God will always give you opportunity if you'll humble yourself and seek reconciliation. God will give you an opportunity to be reconciled. It's when we fold our arms and say, you know what, I don't care what you do. We're in trouble. As long as I'm willing to reconcile, as long as I'm willing to humble myself, God will give me an opportunity. So the effects, although the effects of sin are forever present, a new beginning is allowed. Though the consequence may sting, reconciliation and restoration is always an option for those who will humble themselves and seek God's face. As we close now, I'll ask you two questions. Maybe tonight you're in need of a second chance. You need reconciliation. God's brought Babel into your life. You've got nothing but confusion, heartache, stress. Life just don't, you just can't figure it out because God's allowed Babel to come because you're forsaking God. Get on your knees at the altar and ask for a second chance. Humble yourself and ask to be reconciled and God will give you the opportunity. Maybe tonight you just want to bow at the altar and say thank you God. I've had more than one chance. I've had more than one opportunity. And I've realized it's a picture of your grace, that you love me so much that you won't allow me to continue in sin, and that every time I've asked, you've allowed restoration and reconciliation. And I just want to get on my knees tonight and say, thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you.